Hello again everyone from Tokyo Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today I'm going to be doing a video which I hope uh, many of you will find interesting and informative. Uh, in this video I'm going to be comparing the top pro-level SLR 35mm cameras of the early 1980s. Uh, I have a representative from each of the Japanese makers here. Uh, this is Japan Vintage Camera, so I'm going to be focusing on Japanese cameras today. I don't have any Contaxes or Leikas or Leikas, however you want to say that, uh, to add to uh, this review, or I can do that separately. But uh, what I'm going to be doing today is just kind of giving you a, a side-by-side -side comparison between what were the top pro cameras of that time. A lot of people are interested in film photography. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of questions that I get through my stores and by email with people asking me what kind of camera should I get and uh, you know what is the best for my situation, which is the most reliable or which is the best value. Uh, it's really hard to answer that question because with the large variety of cameras which are out on the market, anything from uh, you know disposable cameras all the way up to cameras like these, uh, it, it's you know, and and the fact that everyone has their own uh, different opinion on what makes a great camera. Uh, I, I thought this might this video might uh, enlighten a few people. Uh, one reason that I'm doing a video about these professional quality uh, SLR cameras is that uh, these are fairly inexpensive, at least some of these are today. Uh, they're certainly much less expensive than they were when they were new. Even uh, e even if you uh, account for inflation, uh, a camera, say like this, you can get a Nikon F3 nowadays for about $250 or $300 for a body if you shop around, which is much less than it cost new back in the 1980s. And uh, th these cameras uh, recently, they tend to be going up in value a little bit and that's kind of a good thing because if you decide to get into this for a hobby and you do it for a while and you decide that it's not for you you can kind of sell your equipment and you'll at least break even on it even if you, you know you may even make a profit on it and there aren't many hobbies like that where you can invest money in them and get it back if you decide that you don't like that hobby uh, too many times i've gotten into stuff and invested money in, in what i thought i was going to be interested in and found out that I didn't like doing it. And when I go to get rid of this stuff, I end up usually giving it away because I can't really sell it. But in the case of these here, they, the cameras are kind of you know, high precision instruments and uh, they have a lot of, uh, you know, they have, they're useful, uh, they're kind of fun to operate uh, and you know, photography is a really fun hobby. And with a camera like this, you know, these cameras here, it, for example, if you buy a camera like this Nikon F3 and say today you go out and buy a Nikon D5, which is several thousand dollars, in say 15 years when you go to sell, if you were going to sell the F3 or the D5, you would get a lot more money than you would for the, for the F3 than you would for the D5. The digitals don't really have much in the way of resale value. And the original D1, which was a ridiculously expensive camera back in the day when it was introduced, uh, eight, nine thousand dollars those things cost when they when Nikon released them. They go for less than a hundred dollars here in Japan nowadays, where um, cameras like this one, I, I bought this F3, this is an F3 P model, which it was a, is a former military uh, issue camera. Uh, I bought this one non-working several years ago for a couple hundred dollars. It's worth about twice what I paid for it nowadays. And the same is true for a lot of these other cameras. They are actually worth more now today than when I picked them up. And these are from my personal collection. These are all cameras which I've owned and which I shoot myself. So to go ahead and start this, I'm going to go ahead and start with, I guess, the granddaddy of them all, the most popular professional camera of the 1980s and up into the 1990s. And that is, of course, the Nikon F3, which was the last manual focus variation of the legendary Nikon F series, or at least the pro level F series. Cameras like, say, the FM2 and FM3 were late, made later after uh, the F3 was uh, uh, stopped. But when it comes to professional cameras, when you think about the professional SLR, F1, F2, F3, those are the ones which, uh, which you know, people think about. Uh, this camera was a wonderful camera. It's incredibly rugged, reliable. It accepts a huge number of accessories, things like uh, motor drives, a variety of different flash units, uh, data backs. Uh, it, it can fit all the F mount lenses. A number of the autofocus lenses will work on this camera if you focus them manually. It has pretty much everything which a professional photographer needed in those days. Uh, the, uh, a wide variety of shutter speeds plus aperture, auto, you know, aperture priority automatic operation. Uh, the professional version added a few extra features. It uh, made the camera more web weatherproof with a, a seal over the shutter button. It added a shoe to the uh, top of the prism rather than on top of the uh, film uh, rewind knob. 
Uh, it deleted a few things which uh, press photographers didn't need, uh, like the safety catch for the film door and uh, the shutter for the uh, eyepiece on the back. Uh, these are a very well-balanced camera, a sophisticated metering system, uh, uh, a backup manual shutter release, so in case uh, the battery goes dead, you can still operate the camera. Depth of field preview, I think I mentioned mirror lockup, and uh, uh, a preview for the light meter, backlight for the uh, metering system on the inside, so you can see it in the dark, and then of course, uh, if I can get this off here, uh, the prism removes and allows you to use a variety of different prisms, uh, sports finders, things like that, uh, macro uh, finders and prisms. Uh, a really wonderful camera and one of the reasons uh, that I would recommend this camera, first, incredibly rugged and reliable, uh, second, the Nikon F mount, and third, the Aperture Priority Automatic Operation System. Uh, even if you don't know anything about photography, uh, you can pretty much start shooting this camera within a few minutes of uh, putting film in it and, and going out to, and putting batteries in it. Next camera I'm going to talk about was the most direct competitor to the Nikon F3, and that is the Canon F1. Uh, this particular one is the uh, F1N with the AE prism, which allowed for shutter priority automatic operation. Uh, what I really like about this camera is its incredible military design with this parkerized finish. Uh, parkerizing is a kind of finish which they put on things like machine guns and rifles and stuff like that, which is uh, weather resistant and protects the metal underneath and it kind of gives this nice matte finish which doesn't reflect light. Uh, these cameras were actually used uh, by the military. Uh, sometimes you will find them with the US marking on the back. Old Nikon sometimes have that as well. Uh, these are very rugged, reliable, uh, durable cameras, and I love the all-metal design. Even the, the battery cover here is made out of cast metal. There isn't much plastic here. The only plastic on these cameras is pretty much the, uh, the plastic, I guess, leatherette covering around them. Uh, they come with the Nikon FD mount, and uh, you don't have as many options or quality options with the FD mount as you do with the Nikon F mount. But the FD lenses are a much better value. You can buy these lenses and, and they are extremely good quality, but, uh, and they're a lot less expensive. A 50 millimeter F1.8 Canon lens like this, you can get for $5 in a lot of places. You can find them on eBay and other places. Uh, a Nikon lens will set you back in you know, at least $40 for the, the cheapest F1.8 lens. Average price is around $100 or so. And of course, uh, Canon made uh, everything from uh, the, you know, super wide angle and fisheye lenses to super telephoto lenses. And this camera can handle all of them. Uh, the old lenses have this kind of quirky bayonet mount with a locking ring on them. Uh, the newer ones featured what, you know, the new FD lenses didn't have this metal ring on them. They had just a, a quick push button mount, which you could simply push the button and remove the lens. Very fast and efficient. Uh, this camera is, uh, if I had the choice between this camera and the Nikon F3, I would probably give the edge to the Nikon F3 because I, I like the automatic operation system. It's much easier to use than uh, on uh, the F1. If you like to shoot full manual, of course, uh, the F1 is completely fine. Uh, a lot of the other features on this camera are the same as on the F3. The controls you'll find pretty much in the same place. And uh, this camera also features the removable prism system just like the, the F3. And uh, it, it's quite resistant to uh, weather, uh, light, rain, stuff like that, but not quite as weatherproof as the F3. Uh, for you Canon fans out there, this is probably the one you would choose. And it, yeah, for me, it's kind of hard for me to choose which I really like the best, and that's why I happen to have both of them, because you know, there are particular lenses which uh, I love in the Canon system, which I, I don't find a, you know, a, a equal lenses in the Nikon F mount system. Like the 35 millimeter f2 that's probably the best 35 millimeter slr lens i've ever used and uh nikon doesn't make one which is uh, in you know to the same level of quality so that's why i have this camera whereas uh on the nikon i love the 50 to 300 ed zoom uh canon's never made a lens like that and so uh you know, sometimes i have a camera body just because it suits a particular lens all right Let's go to one which is uh, the favorite of a lot of people out there, and this is the Pentax LX. And this is, uh, of these cameras, this seems to be the most interesting design. 
it's it, it's a very comfortable design. I love the grip here. I love the, the strap lugs, which you can attach the strap here and then kind of hang the camera uh, like this. Instead of vertically, you hang it horizontally. Uh, I, I love the uh, this camera like the other ones. It has an interchangeable prism system. It, uh, it features automatic or uh, manual operation. And it has the other things, the, the same exposure compensation system and such, which pro level cameras have, but it looks more like a uh, consumer level camera. It doesn't have, like, you can, you can look at the top here. There's pretty much nothing on this camera on the top that you don't need. You have the winder, the shutter button, the, uh, uh, the uh, shutter speed dial, the exposure compensation dial, uh, the, the latch for removing the prism, the hot shoe. Whereas you compare it to a camera like, uh, uh, the F3 here, or excuse me, the F1. A lot of bells and whistles on this camera, which I take a little bit of uh, getting used to when you go out and shoot one of these. Uh, when you're shooting with the Pentax LX, uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it's it's much easier to understand and easier to use. It's a more compact camera, though it's not necessarily a light one. It's a very high precision, good working machine. It probably has one of the best light meters which came in cameras of this era. Uh, these cameras are especially well suited for low light shooting, uh, things like shooting uh, nighttime cityscapes or uh, even astrophotography. Uh, the light meter in these is so sophisticated, it, it, it always measures just the right amount to, of light to get a proper exposure in a dark situation. Uh, the lenses are wonderful. Uh, the SMC Pentax are, uh, are uh, you know, the K-Mount lens or the variety of different lenses which Pentax made. Uh, I fit them somewhere in between. I, pr I probably give them a little bit uh, better quality than the Canon lenses of the time. Uh, and they are still quite a good value. Some of the lenses are quite expensive. The faster lenses are, are ungodly expensive. But the lenses you are most likely to use uh, as in general photography are quite a good value in these cameras and uh, you know, it, it's really uh, hard not to re recommend this camera. Uh, the one issue which these cameras have and which this particular one suffers from is the uh, shutter uh, can be a little sticky. You notice it takes a moment to respond here. That's because the mirror is sticking and uh, it, that I've tried working on this camera. I've got to take it apart and uh, lubricate the, the mechanism. That's the one failing in these cameras. And if you get that situation solved or you have one which doesn't have that issue, I really recommend these cameras. It's a really wonderful uh, machine. Uh, the next one is kind of the oddball, and this is the Minolta, and this is the called the X1 in here in Japan. It's called the XK and other places, and uh, there are a variety of different uh, types of these cameras. This is the oldest of these cameras, but it was produced up until uh, I think 1981 or something. So I'll go ahead and give this. Uh, I'll define this camera is a uh, as an 80s era uh, professional camera, or at least one which people were still shooting in the 80s. Uh, this was based on the earlier uh, Minolta SR cameras and uh, the X, of course, uh, denoted that it was a professional one. Uh, it fits the old uh, MC, MD, Rokor lenses and uh, these are uh, very similar in quality to the, to the Pentax lenses. Uh, some of these, the 58mm f1.2 is kind of a, a real legend for people who shoot the, the, the wide uh, fast aperture lenses, not wide angle lenses, but the uh, wide aperture lenses. And uh, of all the fast a 35 millimeter film lenses or say 50 or 58 millimeter uh, lenses. Uh, that's probably the one which I prefer. Uh, I, I, though I like Nikon and Olympus and Pentax and Canon. When it comes to the fast lenses, I think the, especially the earlier Rokor lenses were better performers. Uh, this camera is a uh, is is a really cool camera. You can see it's a kind of odd looking thing. It doesn't look like anything else which was produced in those days. And uh, and that was kind of the problem. Uh, the styling didn't really catch on. And though this camera did see a little bit of uh, interest in professional photographers, it wasn't that popular. Uh, for one thing, you couldn't actually fit a motor drive to uh, this particular camera. To use a motor-driven uh, Minolta uh, X series, you had to buy the, the X1 motor, which, which used a special uh, body which could you know, work with the motor drive completely, I won't say completely different because most of the other accessories worked on it. But uh, you know, if you wanted a, uh, uh, you know, it, it was odd that you had to buy, you know, if you wanted a motorized camera, you had to buy a completely different body. And that was one of the reasons why this camera never caught on with pros, though it did have, it was, it was quite popular with uh, serious amateurs here in Japan. Uh, these cameras are not very reliable, uh, especially, you know, 
the, the auto mode in these cameras, it very seldom works when I, I happen to come across these. And that I have that issue with this camera. This camera works quite well in manual mode and I can use the light meter and set my settings in it manually, but the auto mode, I can't get it to work. And probably more than half of these cameras, which I find here for sale in Japan, the auto mode doesn't work in them, if they work at all. And probably one out of three of these cameras just doesn't work at all. If you're a Minolta fan and you have uh, some Minolta lenses that you would like to try and you can find one of these in good working condition, uh, you know, I would go ahead and pick it up. Uh, largely because uh, if you get one which is working, they tend to stay working. The only reason, that, or the only time that they stop working is when you put them down and don't use them for a long time. If you exercise these from time to time, they tend to be much more reliable than if you just take them out and shoot them once or twice a year. All right, and the last one I'm going to uh, review is the Olympus. Uh, this is the OM4 tie, which didn't come out till uh, uh, the later 80s, but the, the regular OM4 came out in around 1983, and it would have been on the market and being used by pros uh, around the same time as these other cameras. Uh, this is one of my oldest cameras, as you can tell. It's, it's seen a lot of use. It doesn't have a lot of the original paint left on it. Uh, I really love this camera. Uh, when I first came to Japan, I, this is one which I used for the first year I was here. I used this camera almost exclusively, and I took some really wonderful photographs with it. Uh, compared to the other cameras, this one is by far the lightest and most compact, and it is also the quietest. Uh, it's And uh, it's been used enough that it's kind of, all the rough edges have been worked off of it, and it's kind of smooth, and, uh, and I... Yeah, obviously you can see that, that I like this camera a lot just by how much I, I've used it. Uh, the strength is, strengths of this camera, uh, the number one strength is the metering system, especially the, the spot metering system, which is something that none of these other cameras uh, uh, come with. Uh, this camera, it makes it very easy to, when you're shooting at black subjects, for them to actually look black in your photograph, or if you're shooting, say, a, 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 in the ski slopes or something like that and you want the snow to look white. That's easy to do with this camera. It takes a little bit more work to do with the other cameras. Uh, I also like this camera because I really love these Olympus OM mount lenses. They are very small and compact, very light, and are extremely well designed and well made. Uh, these, the, the rare ones, when I first came to Japan, things like the 40mm f2 or 90mm f2 or you know, fish eyes or 18mm, they, they could still be found for fairly reasonable prices. And now I look at what they are selling for on eBay and places like that, and it's a, they've, they've gone up in value by a thousand percent in some cases. Uh, the cameras themselves, uh, the OM4 tie is a very desirable camera. It, it's it, because it was the, the best camera you could get in this in the OM mount until the OM3 tie came out. The OM3 and the OM4 were similar cameras, but the OM4 had an electronically controlled shutter, whereas the OM3 had a fully mechanical shutter. And the fully mechanical system was uh, carried on to the OM3 tie. Uh, the tie features the mechanical shutter, but also with the same uh, metering functions which the uh, OM4 tie has. Uh, I used to have an OM3 tie, one which was you know, signed by Mr. Maitani himself, but uh, I, I sold that to a collector in Poland who is really uh, loving that camera. And perhaps one of these days I'll go ahead and get another OM3 uh, to go out and shoot with. But so far, uh, this old OM4 has been uh, perfectly fine the way it is. It's very simple to use. It's been very rugged and reliable. It doesn't have the removable prism, prism systems like the other cameras which I'm using here, but uh, the, the wonderful thing about the OM cameras was the you know the design of the the prism was really wonderful. It's very large and very bright, and you really can't improve on it. Uh, it has a very large eyepiece on the back. It's not like the the really big one, unlike the uh, HP or high eye point finders, which come on the Nikon SLR camera. But it's more than wide enough for people who wear glasses. Uh, and uh, the diopter system adjustment, you can use the slide on lenses on it, eye cups, magnifiers, a lot of things which fit on it. A large variety of focusing screens were made for these cameras. I love the self timer with the light and the uh, uh, audio beep, which is something which the other cameras here uh, it didn't come with. And I like the fact that you can put on a motor drive or a power winder on this camera without any uh, hassle whatsoever. You just remove the access cap here and stick it on and just go out and shoot with it. Uh, of, of my cameras here, my, my two favorites, of course, are going to be uh, uh, the F3P and my OM4 tie. And the other ones, which I keep mainly just because I, you know, I, I like them. Uh, I got them and I've had a lot of fun shooting with them and their particular lenses I like to use with them. 
uh, lenses which I would recommend with the OM4 tie. Uh, my favorite lens in the OM mount is the one which is fitted to this camera, and it's the, just the lowly 50mm f1.8. Uh, I've, I've shot with, uh, say, the, uh, the 21mm lens, the 90mm macro lens, the 40mm lens, but for overall quality and just the effect I get, just the basic standard inexpensive 50mm f1.8 lens is my favorite. Anyway. Uh, I'm got into 20 minutes on this video, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned a little bit of something about these cameras. And uh, I'll go ahead and put them back here so you can get another look and kind of get an idea of the size. Maybe I'll put the smallest ones in the front and uh, uh, the biggest ones in the back. Quite a mess of cameras here, and if you think this is a lot, you should see what I have in my closet. Uh, I don't have room to move around in there lately. My wife is getting kind of upset with me. You got to get rid of these cameras. So you know, give them away. Just get rid of them. So uh, maybe one of these days, I might be convinced to sell uh, you know a few more out of my collection. But uh, anyway. Uh, that's it for this video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about these cameras or any experiences you'd like to share, uh, feel free to share them in the comment section below. If you'd like to buy a vintage Japanese camera, please visit one of my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again soon.